some reason, a really gorgeous, um, they, they built this, it looks like it's in a park. Right? And, and the, the main part of it over there is kind of a brutalist 1960s concrete architecture. Done very, in a very delicate way with a set in trees with a lot of benches. It's really, it's just really beautiful. That's where they have the graduation from the farm. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. But I mean, it's you know sort of shocking you know, New Jersey public building to have some really great architect put in, put something together. This is really attractive. Okay, um, so we're back to this case that I want to finish up in just a couple of minutes um, with the car sitting in the driveway. So if we decide under Sean's theory that the goods have been accepted, the car is sitting in the driveway as a security device to guarantee payment of the check, then she has the right to the to um, to the to the price. And the question would then arise: What about if he's already accepted the goods? They've already been delivered, and the hail happens afterward. Do you understand? Under under Sean's theory, delivery takes place, acceptance, and then the hail. Whose responsibility is the hail at that point? The client. Why? Because they already took ownership, so that's not a, a defect. Exactly right. And so let, let me just show you where in the code it would say that. So the first place to see it would be in 2607. Um, well, 2607 sub 2, once the goods are accepted, then there's no more rejection possible. But I, now that I'm seeing, actually the real place to look is 2725, the, the statute of limitations provision. And now let's look at 2725 sub 2. So 2725, 2725 1 says, an action for breach of a contract for sale must be commenced within four years after the cause of action has accrued. What does it mean for the cause of action to accrue? That means from what moment may the uh, aggrieved party sue? And that's what subsection two talks about. A cause of action accrues when the breach occurs. A breach of warranty occurs when tender of delivery is made. So if there, if the seller is responsible for a defect, that defect has to be present at the moment of delivery. If it takes place after delivery, except if there's a risk of loss question, which we'll talk about, then the, um, the seller is not responsible, which is what Clint said. Okay. Is there an alternative interpretation about why the car is still yeah. sitting in the driveway? I would say that delivery never happens because why? The, because the check never get cleared, and by their uh, agreement, they stated. No, I think the check actually did clear. That's why. But he wasn't notified. No, he was not. Yeah, like actually. But I think the unfortunately, check... before he was notified, uh, notified by her bank that the check had cleared, um, that the Helmstrom heavily damaged the vehicle. So, actually, they had never noted like they have never received the notice that the check got cleared so it means car it still was under ownership should yes i would say um well under, under the seller ownership so it means that still her property and why then would the car still be sitting in the driveway under this theory because um this is the just the terms in agreement by the contract that how the seller see the right. But th this contract, and as the court court points out, can be interpreted in, in either of two different ways. One is Sean's way, which is the reason the car, even though the keys have been handed over and the title has been signed, the reason the car is still in the driveway is that she is keeping it as a kind of security interest on the car to guarantee payment. What's the other way of looking at it? 
that's the security for the buyer that this car is with this and this car would be uh, a buyer's car when the check got cleared so it could be a uh so no, no the, the, i mean the, we need one more piece for that memo delivery no but the, the question is has there been delivery that's what we're just trying to get at yeah i'm saying that the, what's the alternative theory for why the car is sitting in the driveway the first is because to benefit the, sale, the seller. Yeah, no, the, the sale will happen, will actually happen when they're gonna exchange, like when she actually gonna get the money and they're gonna deliver the car, right, to, to the buyer. And so for whose benefit then is the car in the driveway? So the, the seller. seller. No, no the, that was Sean's idea. Yeah, the, the, the buyer, because. Why for the buyer? Because it's guaranteed that like, by the moment when he's gonna get, a, anything happens to the car between then and the time that they actually take delivery of the car then it's on the I, don't, I don't think they're worried i don't think they i don't think they see the hail storm yeah uh, the, the, the court the court the court says the alternative theory is that it's there for the buyer's um benefit because it allows him to pay by check and she says okay i'm not going to deliver the car to you until you have to if you're once your check clears i'll deliver the car to you is the point. And so if you look at it, not as a security interest in the car after delivery, but rather she's still keeping the car and she's allowing him the benefit of paying by check, which is what he wants to do, but she's not gonna deliver the car to him until the check clears, then she hasn't delivered yet, which is your point. And if she hasn't delivered yet, then who, who, bears, the, then who bears the risk of that loss? Then, then she bears the risk of the loss. Okay, and so, now, once again, how do we, how do we analyze it under 2711? It's not easy, I'm not claiming it's easy, but we have all the pieces around the table now. You're obviously gonna to have to have two different theories, whether either there was delivery and acceptance, or there was no delivery and acceptance, right? Delivery and acceptance was Sean's theory. No delivery and acceptance is Luda's theory. Do you see that? And there's, we would have to decide the case, but depending on what theory. If he has already accepted, did he reject? No. If he, under Luda's theory, he has not yet accepted because there's no, no, no delivery yet. So then he could reject the car. If he rejects the car, then he gets his money back, right? He can cancel, he can cancel and get a return of the price. Could he, so, once again, there are two theories about whether delivery and acceptance have occurred. And it depends on, and I think the, the, the case is really, you know, well, extremely well done in this regard. It depends on how you interpret why the car is still in the driveway. If the car is in the driveway, under Sean's theory, because even though she has delivered the car and he has accepted it, she is now keeping a kind of a, a possessory security interest in the car until the check clears, then he has accepted it and he can, he can't, at that point, he can't reject it. He may be able to revoke acceptance, we'll talk about that in a minute, but he can't reject it. If instead the car is there to, as a favor to him to allow him to pay by check, and she says, okay, I'm not gonna deliver the car to you until the check clears, then there is no delivery, there is no acceptance, and at that point he just rejects. He says, I reject. Uh, and why would he reject? because the car is no longer is defective because it now has all these hail bumps and she's responsible for it. So that makes it substantively under 2601 gives him the right to reject and all he has to do is reject them in a timely manner. So if that's what's going on, he can cancel and get his money back. He can also only cancel and get his money back if he's able to revoke acceptance. Under Sean's theory, if he's already accepted, he can revoke acceptance if he accepted women, so. Uh, but he cannot revoke because he accepted. 
because he cannot revoke because he's accepted and the goods were okay at the moment of delivery. And as I was pointing out under 2725, that's what I was trying to say, a breach of warranty occurs when tender of delivery is made. So it's at that moment, this is, this is actually a central sales law concept. When do we decide whether the goods have, are conformed to the contract or breach the contract? In general, at the moment of delivery. So if the goods were conforming at the moment of delivery before the hailstorm, then anything that happens later is not, she's not responsible for it. But if the car had another defect other than the hailstorm. Oh, yeah, okay, absolutely. But let's we don't say, have, let's say, let's say the transmission is bad. Then you can revoke the exception. Absolutely. Because that's a prior thing, prior to the exception. It was present at the moment of delivery. So, um, now there's a provision in the code having to do with risk of loss, but it very rarely comes into account. And, and, and in general, we haven't seen it here. I can, I can show you where, um, if you look back at 2709, you can see this, how risk of loss works there. Um, if we take the same fact pattern and assume that for the moment, that here's what happens. The, um, the check doesn't clear, okay? Assume the check doesn't clear. And now she wants to sue him for the price. Look at 2709 again. But this time we're going to look at the second alternative after the or. When the buyer fails to pay the price, right? The check does not clear, so he didn't pay the price. And the price is due, let's assume that it's due. Then the seller, the, the, the young woman, can recover the price not of goods accepted, let's assume he didn't accept them, but of conforming goods lost or damaged within a reasonably, within a commercially reasonable time after the risk of their loss has passed to the buyer. At that moment, if the goods were not yet accepted, the buyer would still owe the price if the risk of their loss had passed to the buyer. Risk of loss, do, do I really want to do this with you right now? The case doesn't need the notion of risk of loss to resolve itself, right? We resolve it without using risk of loss. Most times that risk of loss is used as a concept, it is superfluous. It's not really, it's not necessary for the resolution of the case. Um, it's a very beautiful sales law concept, but it takes a little bit of time to explain. I'm not gonna do it. I'm, I'm just not gonna go there. So if you're interested in risk of loss, I'll show you where it is in the code, and you can read it. It's um, 250, 2509 and 2510. And uh, the basic idea is this, that there's no reason not to, not to know what the basic concept is, but I'm not going to work through it. It's just too complicated. Here's the problem that risk of loss deals with. The goods are damaged between the moment that the, that the contract is concluded and the goods are delivered. In that period, something happens to the goods, which might have been this case. And I'll give you the sort of school hypothetical. You, you and I meet today, and I, I agree to sell you my cow, Bessie. Okay? And Bessie is in my farm, and in the barn, and she's perfectly fine. And so we shake on, on the contract, right? And uh, we agree to it. And I agree to deliver Bessie to you, you know, in two weeks when our next class comes. Okay, in between now and two weeks, our next class, the barn, not due to my fault or anybody else's fault, the barn is struck by lightning and Bessie is no more. What happens now? I'm supposed to deliver, I was theoretically supposed to deliver Bessie to you. But Bessie has, Bessie doesn't exist. Bessie is no more. She's now a state. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
I still have to be an investment to you? And do you still have to pay me in Christ? Fair. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What do you think the answer is to those questions? I would say no, because the subject matter of the contract no longer exists. So, the the the, the Latin the Latin phrase for it is. No, you, that's not hard. Impossibilium nulla est obligatio. In the case of impossibility, the obligation is void. So if, the, 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 why is this important? You know this from contract law, that um, impossibility is an excuse for performance in contracts. So if I have obligated myself to deliver to you Bessie, and Bessie, at the moment I'm supposed to deliver her to you, no longer exists, I am excused, okay? That is a contracts law notion. We don't force people to do things that are impossible. Instead, if the, if the subject matter of the contract is no longer available, the, the, the obligation is just better than void. It's the obligation is discharged, right? Exactly as you're pointing out. You, you can see why that makes sense. It makes, now, I, 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 used, I used Bessie consciously as an example, a named individual object, a particular specific object. If instead I had agreed to sell you a thousand pounds of grain, the destruction of any particular amount of grain doesn't make that contract impossible. I can go get grain anywhere. Do you, do you see? So we're talking about specific goods for, for investing. Okay. Under contract law, my obligation to deliver to cure to you is what about your obligation to pay me for it? Right? The contract had two obligations. All that happens with the possibility is that it's impossible now for me to deliver Bessie to you, so my obligation is discharged. Can I still recover the price from you? No. no. Okay, why not? There's no consideration at that point. Well, cons there was consideration originally when we started the contract. And but so it's now impossible for you to fulfill your obligation as far as the consideration is concerned, so. So, what 2613 does in that situation is it says, where the contract requires for its performance, goods identified when the contract is made. Bessie, right? She's identified. And the goods suffer casually without fault of either party. She was destroyed by lightning, and I, and I specified that it wasn't by any fault. Before the risk of loss passes to the buyer, then if the loss is total, the contract is avoided. So the, the question then is, has the risk of the loss passed? And that question is dealt with in 2509 and 2510. And the basic idea under 2509 is um, two five one nine sub three. It's much more complicated, but two five one nine sub three is a is a good place to start and stop. The risk of loss. It's much more complicated than this. There are many many other provisions, but if we assume that I'm not supposed to send her to you that maybe, maybe you, if you were supposed to pick her up at my farm, then the risk of loss passes to the buyer on his receipt of the goods if the seller is a merchant, or otherwise the risk passes to the buyer on tender of delivery. And since the buyer, in my Bessie case, you never received my Bessie, and I was never able to tender her to you, the risk of their loss never passed to you as the buyer, therefore you don't have to pay me for it. Okay? That's the idea of risk of loss. What happens to the price obligation if the goods are destroyed between the moment of the contract and the moment the goods are delivered? Okay? So that, that's the concept. And it turns out that the way the UCC is written, it, it very rarely comes into play. And it wasn't even necessary for the resolution of the case that we were looking at. We resolved that case without recourse to risk of loss. So, okay, but so that's what the concept is. Now, what I'm going to do is take the, take the half. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question. Um, let's say this 
we get this kind of question. And, and, and you're likely to. Right. And like we have to include two seven eleven. Do we have to include the risk of loss too? To I, I'm gonna do everything I can not to give you a risk of loss problem. Okay. Great. Um, most mostly what we're gonna do is cover on the exam the things that we covered in class. Okay. And and risk of loss is too hard. I mean, it's, it's not ultimately too hard, but we don't have enough time to really do it. We have to write 300 words, so. Right. I mean, if I can make a mistake, it's possible that I give you an exam and risk of loss is in it, and I don't see it when I when I write the exam. And if you're able to, to resolve it, good. But I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try my best not to do that, okay? What I do wanna do, though, is cover the stuff that you were in charge of, which is um, the, the warranty liability. Not so much product liability. So the, 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 the book deals that that chapter is extremely rich and has many, many cases and it deals with a whole lot of other things. If you were to choose one case, which would be the one that you would choose? Me? Well, the two of you. Which uh, one? Which is, so we'll see whether it's one that I want to do. Which is the one that you would like to do? I could do the first one. Uh, let's see, so what page is that on? Uh, 527. Okay, express. Um, so future performance is too hard. It's, what I mean, it's too hard. It's not. It's not ultimately too hard. It's really fascinating. The question of future performance is really fascinating, but it doesn't go to the heart of what I want to deal with right now. Um, future performance are quest. Well, you've read the case. What? What, what else might you want to look at? I guess the. The next one dealt with. I want to look at something having to do with express warranties. Hold on, let me see what I can find. So the, the strict liability, the, the products liability cases, um, the economic loss rule, I don't want that right now. Privity, I don't want that. Disclaimer, what about that one? That's uh, Wilco versus Woodhouse on page 554. That would be a bad Okay, so here, but, uh, but no, so I'm just going to do something else. I'm going to, um, I'm going to draw it on the board. Organizational chart on the board so you can deal with warranties. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, chart. And then, and then we'll if there's a little bit of time left, we'll do one of these. But, but I care mostly about getting the organizational structure clear for you. So we, we always, when the buyer, when the buyer wants some remedy, the question is whether the goods conform to the Right? He gets damages if he's able to show some kind of non conformity <coughs> And he can return the goods if he shows some kind of non conformity So what kind of non conformity are we talking about? And the code has a series of concepts to explain the non conformities that, are, that happen with goods. So do you understand that if the goods are perfectly acceptable and if they match the contract, the buyer can't get any remedy, right? He can't return them, he can't sue for damages, but he can if the goods are defective in some way, if they are non-conforming, sort of the same problem. So how do we analyze the question of non-conformity? So let, let me put that on the board. uses for non-conformities of the goods is the concept of warranty. Warranty is just another, it's the same etymologically, it's the same word as guarantee. What it means is, is that the seller sort of guarantees that the goods have the qualities that 
that for some reason or another are, are promised in the contract. This is a shift. This is one of Grimm's laws, the, the shift between the G and the W. You, you know these in other ways. So for example, um, here's a French word. What's the English equivalent of that? War. War, War right? The French word is guerre or guerre. And there's a shift that took place between the Romance languages and the German languages from G to W. So guerre equals war, just like guarantee equals warranty. There are many of these. Um, you know the, what the English is to the French, Guillaume? William. William, right. Or uh, the French, Garda Volga. Right? So there's a whole series of shifts like, I mean, the, 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 linguistically there's a common thing. So guarantee and warranty are really the same thing. And, and all that the warranties mean is that the seller guarantees that the product will have the, um, the qualities that are, that are promised. Warranties now come in, in a variety of flavors. And I'm going I'm to draw the chart for you so that you can follow them. There are warranties of title, and then there are warranties of quality. This is 2, 3, 12. And this is more complicated. Warranty of title means that the seller has good title to the goods. So if I try to sell you Michael's water bottle and you pay me for it, and then I deliver the bottle to you, and then you're about to open it and Michael comes and says, wait a minute, that's my bottle. And it is. I breached the warranty of title. Do you see that? Because I don't have title to the goods that I've sold you. And he will be able to get them back and then pull them out of your hands, and then you have to sue me because I have breached my warranty of title. Do you understand? Okay. Warranties of quality have to do with the qualities of the goods, not their legal status, but what what their their um, what they themselves are like. And they, they come in two different types. There are express warranties, there are implied warranties. Express warranties are governed under 2313, and implied warranties, there are of two kinds. There is warranties of um, merchantability and fitness. And this is 2314. Implied means that they are implied into a contract under certain circumstances, which we will investigate in just a minute. Express means that the parties agree to them, that there's some kind of express language that's used. Of implied warranties, there are two types. There's merchantability, which means that the goods are fit for the ordinary purposes for which goods of that kind are ordinarily used. And fitness means that they're fit for some particular purpose that the, that the buyer communicated to the seller. And he said to the seller, tell me which is the best goods for my purpose. And the seller says, these are. Well, then there's a warranty of fitness that the goods are fit for that purpose, okay? Just a little tiny parenthesis. The warranty of title is also implied, but we don't call it an implied warranty for the purposes that I'm about to talk about. When we talk about implied warranties, we talk about merchantability. Why do I do this? Because, is there another color? Yeah, there's a brown. Excellent. So we're about, I'm about to show you how you can tell whether the warranty arises by looking at these sections. But then there's a separate question that needs to be analyzed, which is, if the warranty arises, I'm gonna go through the code with you, you're gonna see this in just a minute. But if the warranty arises, those warranties mostly, can, mostly not all, can be disclaimed. And the requirements for the disclaimer of each of the different warranties has different requirements and there are different sections of the code. So you need to know what warranty you're dealing with to know whether the disclaimer is valid. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. 
So in green, in green, I'm going to show you where the disclaimer language is. This is the, the why is this too complicated? No, I got it. I don't have a problem. <laughs> so whenever a warranty question arises, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do our warranty box. I'm gonna show you how to do it right now. And the warranty box has three elements in it. Always for every warranty question that arises. Did it arise? Was it disclaimed? There's one here. A different color? Red. question arises, these are the three questions that you need to ask in that order. And I'm about to go through with you looking at each of the languages in these sections, 2, 3, 12, 13, 14, and 15, to know whether the warranty arises. Then we'll ask, was it disclaimed? And you'll see, I gotta get the right color. <coughs> the disclaimer of the warranty of title Warranty arise. I'm going to show you very easily how to do this. Was it disclaimed? So if it did arise, was it disclaimed? And if it was not disclaimed, was it breached? Okay, how do we do it? It's, it's very easy. But um, let's look together at these sections. Look at 2312. 2312 is the warranty of title. Assume that the seller sells goods to the buyer. I want to ask, did a warranty of title arise in that contract? Let's read the section together and you'll answer it for me. 2312 sub 1. <coughs> Subject to subsection 2. There is in a contract for sale a warranty by the seller that the title conveyed shall be good and its transfer rightful. In what sales contracts does, it, does the warranty of title arise? From that language. How do we know whether in a sales contract there is a warranty of title? What? What does the language say? There is in a contract for sale a warranty by the seller that title conveyed shall be good. What has to happen for there to be a warranty of title? Good title. Now that's what the question of whether the title is good is a question of was the was the warranty breached? Okay. Does the warranty arise? Or when does the warranty arise? It arises in every contract of sale. It says it right there. There is in a contract for sale a warranty by the seller that the title is good. Okay? So it's implied in every contract of sale that there is good title. Right? You don't want to be buying goods to which you know Michael has title from me. Okay. How do I exclude that warranty? It's possible to exclude the warranty or disclaim it. That's in 2312 sub 2. A warranty under one 
will be excluded or modified only by specific language or by circumstances which give the right by a reason to know that the person selling does not claim title in himself or that he is purporting to sell only such right title as he or a third person may have. So I can say, look, Michael and I have been arguing about this model ever since, you know, ever since this program started. I think it's mine, he thinks it's his, I'm not sure. So for 50 cents, I'll sell you my interest in that bond, and then you argue it out with Michael, okay? I have, you see, I've now, I've now disclaimed or excluded my warranty of title to the, buy, to the bottle because I've said to him, look, I don't know whether I have title or not, but if you really want that bottle, if you want to argue it out with Michael, here I give you all of my rights for 50 cents, okay? So do you understand? The question is, did the warranty arise? Yes, in every contract of sale there's a warranty of title. Was it disclaimed? Yes, because I modified it according to subsection two. Now let's look at express warranties. That's two, three, 13. <clears throat> express warranties by the seller are created as follows. Any affirmation of fact or promise made by the seller to the buyer, which relates to the goods and becomes part of the basis of the bargain, creates an express warranty that the goods shall conform to the affirmation or promise. So I sell you that bottle and I tell you that in it um, is pure, unfiltered um, what? mountain water from France. Okay. Has an express warranty arisen with regard to that water? No. Why not? Because it wasn't part of the bargain. Well, no. So just... let's assume that I'm we're entering into a contract, and so now, of course, the less of it now. Like I said. <laughs> you want the bottle? You can have the bottle. <laughs> so now, let's assume this is my bottle, <laughs> and let's assume now that it's filled with water. Okay. In fact, I can. Pour. <laughs> okay. So now. I want to sell it. I'm, I want to sell it to Matt. Okay, and I'm going to say, Matt, I'm going to, I would sell you. I'm going to sell you a bottle of pure water from melted snow of uh, of Mont Blanc. And it's what it's contained in this, and I'll sell it to you for a dollar. Okay, we shake on. Okay. Is that an express warranty? Yes. Yes. Why? Because you said that this car, like the. This water is um, like it's not the regular water. Yeah, and you yeah you put a certain characteristic to that. So if it's a regular water, then it means I mean you, you just insure and buy like you put that on the contract before he he bought the water. And so if you look at two three thirteen, which governs exactly express warranties, Luda, analyze it for me element by element. Do we have an express warranty. Yes, because you do have a promise. So is it is there an affirmation of fact? Yeah. Yes. The affirmation of fact is this water comes from Mont Blanc. Yes. Okay? Yes. Made by the seller to the buyer. I was yes. the seller, Matt is the buyer, mm -hmm. okay? Which relates to the goods. Yes. So I'm not saying that the day is beautiful, right? If I say the day is beautiful, that has nothing to do with the goods. Mm -hmm. But here I say, the water comes from Mont Blanc. That relates to the goods, right? Yes. And becomes part of the basis of the bargain. Yes. So we assume that any time I make a statement like that, Matt is not gonna pay $1 for my bottle until, if, if, those, if that isn't true. Mm -hmm. Now it could be, for example, that he saw me fill it up from that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Would you> then? <laughs> and, and I'm assuming that that water does not come from Mont Blanc, right? Okay, we're lucky if it's potable, right? <laughs> so if Matt knows that, if he sees me filling it up from that water, then he's not relying on that. He's just thirsty and he wants, he, he's happy to pay a dollar for the bottle 
wherever, I mean, even though he knows it comes from me. So if I can prove that he saw me fill it up from there and he knows that that wasn't true, then maybe it's not part of the basis of the bargain. But most of the time, when I make a statement like that, the other side will be entitled to rely on it, and that makes it part of the basis of the bargain. So that's an express warranty. Now, the, things about, the, the most interesting thing about an express warranty is that essentially, once you make it, it cannot be excluded. Where we would look to see about exclusion is 2316 sub 1, right? 2316 sub 1 is on the same page there. Words or conduct relevant to the creation of an express warranty, <coughs> words or conduct tending to negate or limit warranty, shall be construed whenever reasonable as consistent. But subject to this, it is inoperative to the extent that such construction is unreasonable. So what if I do the following? If I, if I offer Matt the bottle, say that the water comes from Mont Blanc, and then I say, by the way, let's sign a contract. And in the contract, there's a little phrase that says, no warranties. What now? You see, I've made a statement to him. I've said that the water comes from Mont Blanc, and, we, and he's bought it from me. But in the contract, it says, no warranties. Have I managed to exclude that warranty? That promise? Yes, yes, because you see that in a contract that there is no warranty. It just could be as an enter advertisement. Does two does two three sixteen sub one allow me to disclaim that warranty? No. Why not? I would say that that limitation is inoperative to the extent that such construction is unreasonable. So all I can do in the writing after making a statement like that is um, if I negate or limit the warranty, it is inoperable. It doesn't, has no effect. So it has to be consistent with the warranty. And the only example of a consistent limitation with an express warranty that I've come up with is the following. I, I'm selling you a machine and I draw the machine on the diagram and I give you measurements six feet by three feet by four feet. And then I write down in the corner, all measurements are approximate. That is consistent with three feet by four feet by two feet, so, so that's fine. But if I say water from Mont Blanc, and then I also say no warranties, that's inconsistent. And you can't, once I make the statement, it's very difficult to undo the statement and take it out of the contract, okay? Those are express warranties. But like, for example, if there is no evidence, like for example, Matt cannot, he cannot prove that you actually did state that this is like special water, but in the contract it says no warranty. So the problem of proving whether I say it, that's a, those are evidentiary questions, which we, we tend to think of as a different kind of question. When I say, you know, proving that I said it to Matt, he would have no trouble here because here we've got you know twenty witnesses, right? All extremely. But it will, like, what if it will be like only one, but two ones? So. If there's a problem of proof, then we have a problem of proof. But for purposes of our warranty thing, let's assume that we can prove everything we've got. It's a good question. It's important to see that proof problems are not the same as the substantive problems that we're dealing with. That's very important. Okay. I, now, two, three, fourteen is the warranty of merchantability. Tell me when, when the warranty of merchantability arises. Unless excluded, etc., a warranty that the goods shall be merchantable is implied in a contract for their sale if the seller is a merchant with respect to goods of that kind. So if I'm a water, if I'm a water vendor. So if, and, and the, 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 the substance, the content of the warranty of merchantability of subsection two, and look at 2C is the most important one. Goods to be merchantable must be at least such as C are fit for the ordinary purposes for which such goods are used. Okay? Now, when I sell this to Matt, does it have an implied warranty of merchantability? Yes. Yes. How do you know? When does the warranty of merchantability arise? Fit for the ordinary purposes. No, that's what it has to. For the warranty to be met, 
the goods have to be fit for the ordinary purposes. But whether the warranty arises is a preliminary question. Whether you're a water, if you're a merchant. Whether I'm a merchant. Am I a merchant with regard to water? No. No. And remember, merchant is defined earlier in the code in, in, in Article 2. I think it's 2104. There's a definition of merchant if you need it. But am I likely to be a merchant in, for water? No. So there's no warranty of merchantability when I sell this water to Matt. It's also the case that, say, you are a water salesman and you sell him a football helmet. I'm not a merchant with regard to foot help, foot shop. Foot okay. 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 okay, how do I disclaim the warranty of merchantability? There are two ways of doing it, subsection 2316.2 and 2316.3. Two says, to exclude or modify the implied warranty of merchantability, it must mention merchantability, and in the case of a writing, it must be conspicuous, okay? But in my case, with the sale to Matt, the warranty doesn't arise, so I don't need to disclaim it. 2315 is the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, and there you see that one arises where the seller at the time of contracting has reason to know any particular purpose for which the goods are required, and if the buyer is relying on the seller's skill or judgment, there is, unless excluded, an implied warranty that the goods shall be fit. So, fitness warranty arises when the buyer relies on the seller to select the goods for him. And that can be disclaimed under subsection two. Uh, language to exclude fitness is sufficient if it states there are no warranties which extend beyond the description. And subsection three says, as far as implied warranties are concerned, Unless the circumstances indicate otherwise, all implied warranties are excluded by expressions like as is, with all faults, or other language which in common understanding calls the buyer's attention to the exclusion of warranty. The only language that really works is as is. And if I sell you something as is, everybody understands that, that the warranty, the implied warranties are excluded. Not the express warranties, but the implied warranties. Okay? So, all, so here's what I wanted to do. I want you to see that whenever, a, whenever you face a warranty question, the question is whether the buyer can reject the goods. He can reject the goods if the goods are non-conforming. They're non-conforming if they don't comply to the warranties. For each one of these warranties that might arise, you separately ask, did it arise by looking in the code provision? It says specifically when it arises. Was it disclaimed? by looking to see whether it was successfully disclaimed under any of the green sections here. And then the question of, was it, was, was it breached? You have to locate the content in the section and then decide whether it was conformed with. So for breach of good title, did I convey good title? If I did not, I breached it. Did it for warranty of merchantability, did the goods conform to the ordinary purposes for which such goods are used? If they do, it breaches it. It, 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 it meets it, if it doesn't, it breaches it. Or for the expressed water, you know, did the water come from Mont Blanc? Okay? Okay, so you now have, actually, even though, even though it was sort of chaotic, you have a complete understanding of sales law. You should be able to do almost every sales law question because you know where to find the remedies and you know how to solve the warranties problems. And so, remember, what I'd like you to do, so we don't meet, we don't meet next week, right? Next week is a holiday. In two weeks, we're gonna do, um, we do the next two sections, which are, uh, wait a minute. No, we do sale, we do, oh, we, do, we continue with, oh, 